Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, for those of you who just joined, my name is Tyler Wiggins. I am the product development manager here at Everest Solar Systems. And today I'm going to be talking with you about our mini rail express system. The system is specific for trapezoidal metal roofs. I'm also going to be going over our uh, base on system and how to design these solar systems uh, with our tool, their online tool, how to get a bill of material, uh, going over some of the technical documents for this system. And uh, then at the end, I'll leave some time to answer questions. Um, how to ask a question with GoToWebinar, uh, as you'll see, uh, there's a little graphic, uh, graphic user interface. As a questions box, please uh, ask your questions there at any time during the webinar. Uh, at the very end, I will be going through um, each of those questions. Um, I'm going to try and uh, keep this to an hour today. The last time we had a base on webinar, it went about an hour and a half with the questions. So um, we'll see how quickly this one goes. Uh, this webinar is going to be recorded. So if this goes beyond a time that you're able to attend, please note this will be recorded. So um, we'll email that to you guys and you'll be able to watch anything that you may have missed. Um, with that said, I will get started uh, with a brief uh, overview of Everest Solar Systems and some of the products that we offer. So um, Everest Solar Systems provides racking solutions for a variety of different uh, roof types. I definitely consider ourselves specialists um, for global economic applications, um, installing in most parts of the world on a variety of different roof types. Uh, from your typical comp shingle that you might see in the US to concrete uh, tile roofs you may see in Mexico. We do offer solutions for a variety of different uh, applications. Um, as I said before, we are definitely a global company, um, part of the K2 group, um, which is located, the headquarters is located in Germany, but they have offices all over the world um, Everest is located currently in the U.S. as well as Guadalajara, uh, Mexico. Our company at a glance, we have 117 employees here, seven global locations, uh, many, many distributors with over five and a half gigawatts installed over the last, I believe, uh, 12 to 15 years. Um, as I stated before, global, we've installed in over 110 countries with many more on the way, um, starting to see a lot more uh, growth in uh, Latin America and South America. As you can see, a um, lot more South America turning red on this map, which is great to see. As far as innovation goes, we're continually trying to reduce the material with our products while maintaining uh, the highest quality. Um, as you can see with the image in the upper right, our original express rail system consisted of rails that spanned across um, those gaps between the crests in the trapezoidal metal roof. These were attached with a um, glass filled plastic clip that went on there and it was screwed in. So with our new mini rail system, uh, we're able to reduce material by creating shorter sections of rail that attach. So it's very similar to I guess what you could definitely say is a, a railless system here. So different than what you might see on a comp shingle roof, um, lacking that um, ability to be leveled, but typically with these installations, you don't really need that. Um, again, dependent on roof type. So one thing I wanna state uh, at the beginning of this webinar is that Mini Rail Express does not work for all metal roof types. It is specific to trapezoidal metal roof. So we get that question a lot, you know, can we use this on corrugated? Can we use this on a standing seam application? Uh, the answer is no, it's not designed for those roof types. It is designed specifically for trapezoidal metal roof. And we'll get into the technical details on what specific trapezoidal metal roofs that this product does work for. Um, one thing I want to uh, state as well is that this product uh, does have a 20 year warranty along with our other racking uh, systems. So as I stated before, um, mini rail basically is composed of you know, very few components. We have these short rail sections here. Um, 
that have a layer of EPDM underneath to assist with that water sealing. Um, and then there is uh, the screws um, that are used to mechanically attach these rail sections to the uh, metal roof. So um, they also have an EPDM washer that helps with that water prevention. Um, the system's pre-engineered for uh, roofs from 18 gauge up to 26 gauge, um, special order options for those 29 gauge roofs that you might see. Um, I also want to state that this product is UL2703 listed. We'll get into bonding here shortly. Um, and then last as far as, well, almost last as far as component count goes is the clamps. So as stated before, these clamps uh, are UL2703 listed. What's nice about them is they come pre-assembled uh, with the spring-loaded capability, which is uh, definitely a fan favorite from our customers. It allows the clamp to stand upright. So when you're installing the modules, it makes it uh, a lot easier to install and clamp down, which definitely uh, makes it easier for all the contractors that are up on the roof trying to install this thing. Uh, the last component is the ground lug, also ground lug that goes on there. So um, for those of you who, in, who have installed our cross rail system or are familiar with uh, dual railed systems, the grounding path is very similar. So instead of having two rails running underneath each row of modules, you have these components, these railless components running two underneath each, each row of modules. So this grounding component needs to go on one of those rails in the row. Um, directly onto the mini rail uh, component. So very similar to what you would see in a dual rail system. Um, as I stated before, we're going to talk about the Bason system, uh, specifically how to design these mini rail systems uh, using our online tool, how to get a bill of material, how to see what uh, loading may be compatible. Um, provide a layout as well to assist with the installation. So we're gonna go over all that today. So for those of you who just joined, I just wanna say real fast, um, this webinar is going to be recorded. So if you missed anything, we're going to email that out to you um, later today or possibly early tomorrow. So let me get started here um, with our online tool with Bason. So this is the, the front page of our website, um, located at everestsolarsystems.com. Uh, first, before I get into Bason, I wanna talk about some of the capabilities of the mini rail system and how to find that for you guys. So the easiest thing to do is to click the menu button at the top left and then select products. And under products, you'll have all of our systems listed here. The Mini Rail Express system is going to be the, the system we're talking about today. Go ahead and click on Mini Rail Express. And then scroll down to the Downloads tab, have our technical information. The first thing I'm going to open up is our uh, assembly instructions. This has a lot of basics on the capabilities of the system. So I'll come back to that um, as we're designing our system on base on today. And then the next thing I want to open up, we'll talk about this right now, is the engineering letter. So this specifically lays out exactly what this system can do. Let me zoom in here to make it easier to read. So um, as I stated before, there are some limitations with this system, being that it is dependent on the mechanical fastening of the components to the metal roof. It does have some limitations which are listed in this letter here. Um, some important limitations to state right off the bat are the ground snow load. I get questions about this. What's the maximum ground snow load? 60 PSF is the maximum. Uh, for those of you in areas that do not have snow loading or might be hurricane prone areas, the max wind speed per ASCE 710 against per ASCE 710, the max wind speed is 150 miles an hour. So I know that there are some viewers today who are listening in from Mexico. Um, I know that Mexico's code requirements are different than the US per ASCE 710 and 705. Um, we do have a 
number of engineers who work in our office in Guadalajara. I will be posting their contact information on this at the end of the webinar. They will be able to help you find an applicable wind speed um, for the area of Mexico that you're working in. Um, as we move forward with developing this system more, we are going to have wind speed specific to Mexico to help our designers, contractors, anyone who's trying to install a system down there, create one that is more applicable to those wind speeds. But for now, um, we do have some engineers who can assist you in figuring out uh, an applicable wind speed for those installations. Another key uh, limitation of this system that I want to say that before we get started is the zone in which it can be installed in, uh, pressure zone one. This is not to say that it could not be installed in zone two or three. However, if you were to do so, you would have the engineer of record would have to take a closer look at the system. Per our pre-engineered pre system, it's only applicable for zone one installations, and we will get into exactly what constitutes a zone one, zone two, or zone three um, later in this presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with our base on system. Again, the best way to navigate there is with our um, handy menu button here at the top left. So we'll click on that. And then we will click on your project. And we have two online tools. The Crossrail design tool is basically, as it describes, it's specific to Crossrail. So this is for our Crossrail dual rail and Crossrail tilt options. The base on online design tool is for DDoMar squared as well as mini rail. So in the future, we're planning on migrating everything over to this base on system. Um, that's going to take some time to program. So as for right now, it is just with DDoMar squared as well as mini rail. So we'll click on this here directly to base on. Uh, to use this, you'll have to create an account. It's very easy uh, for some very basic information. Um, send you an email to uh, get that approved and then you can start using the system so nothing too crazy on that so begin a new project we'll click on new project you also have the option of clicking this button up here in the top left so click on new project click OK here um, it'll bring you up a map um, this does work for any address in the world um, as far as where you want to install. Uh, I get questions, common question I get is, uh, you know, does this work for Mexico? It does, you know, input a Mexican address, it will bring that up. Um, another question I get asked, and I want to uh, answer this um, sooner rather than later in this presentation is uh, languages, which we have here. We do have a multitude of different languages here. Um, and units. So majority of our customers around the world are installing in metric. You can design in metric or in imperial. Um, I'm going to use imperial as the majority of the products I'm working on are in the US and those are the units that are primarily used here. Um, metric is also an option so I want to let you guys know that you, you have the option to use either one. So I'm going to go with imperial. Um, the address I chose today is in Chula Vista near San Diego. I'll go ahead and type that in here. Street. Uh, Chula Vista, here it is, so it pops right up. Um, and these are the, the two roofs I want to focus on today, this one right here and this one right here. So uh, again, I want to reiterate this. Um, this question gets asked a lot, and I also think it's important to have these considerations when you're designing this type of system is that mini rail um, does work for many trapezoidal metal roof uh, situations. However, um, there will be situations where it may not be the best option and it really just comes down to the quality of the roof, um, the way in which that roof was designed, um, things like that. Uh, it is dependent, as we stated before, on the mechanical attachment of the mini rail component to the metal roof. So if that metal roof has poor attachment to the purlins beneath it, then there could be some issues, some concerns with that. So it's important to speak with the engineer of record on the project that is going to be you know, signing off that they are comfortable with that system being installed the way that it is. Um, so it's it's definitely something that needs to be considered early on in the design. 
Um, with that said, with these two roofs, um, you know, I, I'm using this as an example because I like the way that they look, um, but we're gonna assume that that due diligence has been done, that these roofs are compatible with the mini rail system, and we'll move forward from there. So um, first thing to do, let's give it a project name. Um, normally I just use the uh, address, makes it easy. Um, design method. Uh, so this is definitely specific to the United States. Uh, again, with our listeners calling in from Mexico, uh, the best thing to do would be speak with one of our representatives in Guadalajara to see what design method will be best for the area in which you're installing those systems. So I know with California, um, we're on ACE 710, so I'll go with that. Um, let's put a, an example here. Really, it could be whoever's working on it. Um, customer name, it's important to fill that out, Mr. Customer. And then could be email, phone number, wh whatever it is, whatever works best for you. Um, so we have that filled out, go to the roof tab. And the way BASON works is we're basically working across these sections here. So started with our project info. Um, we'll move on to roof tab. After that, we'll be designing the system, putting the modules in. Next, we'll be determining wind loads, snow loads, things like that. Looking at our results and then moving on to our summary. So start with the roof tab here at our roof. So with this project, i um, just gonna assume that we want to install on this roof here, as well as this roof here. So we'll start off with this roof here, showing over, going over the basics, I'll be skipping obstructions. And then as I go on to this roof here, I will be adding obstructions in. So we're trying to cover as much as we can today. So um, we have two options here, mono rich or, or sorry, uh, mono pitch roof or gable roof. Um, so this will be gable rectangular in shape, and then trapezoidal metal roof is what we're working with today. Go ahead and click on add. Um, so if you want to move this map around, uh, you'll want to use the middle click where the scroll wheel is. Um, scrolling in and out is your zoom right here. So first thing I'll do is start in the corner and I'm tracing out the roof in which I am installing the system on. this area right here. So once it turns green, I'll single click and that releases it. And now I have my roof drawn. So a question I get asked often is what does this arrow mean? This arrow is indicating the direction in which the roof is sloping. So I know the top of the roof is here, bottom down here, it's sloping down this way. Uh, so some important things to, again, consider off the bat with mini rail limitations go roof height, um, as stated in the engineering letter, building roof mean height, uh, 30 feet or less. So it, it defaults to 30. Um, I believe this to be a 30 foot tall roof. It may even be less than that. Um, for this example, we'll just use 30 to make our lives easier. A roof pitch, again, if we're looking for limitations, uh, here it's good for zero up to 27 degree sloped roofs so um, for this i'll just assume 20 degrees uh, that'll work for this example a uh, crest distance uh, what is this referring to this is referring to the distance between the crests on the trapezoidal metal roof so this does have limitations um, I believe 16 inches is the max. So if I put a number, yeah, put a number greater than that, it will default down to 16. So for this example, we'll assume 12 inch crest distance. The crest width, this is a big one for those calling in from Mexico. Um, this one actually comes up a lot. Uh, we see a lot of different uh, style of trapezoidal metal roofs in those markets. Um, it's common to see ones with crest widths that are too, um, too wide. Well, too thin. <laughs> Not sure what the word to use is there, but they're too too skinny. They the the best we can do is 0.9. So if I put in 0.8, it will default back to 0.9 inches. Um, the metric conversion probably somewhere around 21, 22 millimeters. Um, so uh, 0.9 inches is the minimum there. So we'll just go with one for this example, one inch. Uh, crest height. 
Uh, this is referring to the the height of that trapezoid trapezoidal uh, crest. We'll go with one inch for this example. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the gauge, there are some limitations there. Um, 18 to 26 and 29 are pretty much the standards, but we will go with a 22 gauge here for this example. Uh, sheet material, the only option is steel at this time. Um, so if you have a roof that is made of a different material, please let us know and we'll see if there's anything we can do. Uh, obstructions would be next. Um, there are none on this particular roof, so we will not uh, go over those, but um, we will when we move on to our next roof. So moving on to the design tab where we're going to add our modules. Um, we have uh, some options here. We can either choose a module from our database, which we have here. Um, due to the how quickly new modules are coming out, it, it can be difficult to keep this um, up to date with all of the manufacturers' new modules as well as um, with the tariffs going on and finding modules for this for particular project. It, might, it may not be on that list. That's fine. Um, we do have a user defined option, so you can click this box here and you can add a, a custom length, width, frame height, all that um, module uh, into the system and use that. For this example today, I will just go with a with one on the list. I'll go with the LG. Um, we'll use a A5. Makes it easy. Okay. Now on to module arrays. Um, how to add a module array, you'll click this plus button just like we did for adding the roof. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and click on Mini Rail Express because that's the only rail option we have for this roof type at the moment. Um, and then you have a couple options here on how you want to um, fill this roof. So if you click on complete roof, it's basically going to fill that roof, the maximum amount of modules you can have. We'll do that on the next roof. For this one, we'll start off with a module field. Um, orientation, you have your options between landscape and portrait. We'll go with portrait for this example. Go ahead and click add. Um, for drawing the roof, it's just, or sorry, drawing the, the module field is just like drawing the roof. Click once, pull it out to the size that you want and click again. We will be able to modify this. So if you're, let's say you're trying to get a certain amount of modules on there, um, you can just make it any size and we can uh, adjust it as needed. So um, we'll start off with me right there. So it adds the modules in, so you can see right there. Um, so some things to, to speak to right off the bat, um, edge distances. So these are important um, with regard to AHJ requirements on what those edge distances can be. Uh, it's very important to figure out what those are during the design phase. So this system does not take into account, this base on system does not take into account specific AHJ requirements for the address that this is installed at. And I know that these can vary substantially even from city to city in the same county. I've seen that. Um, maybe not so much in California, I've seen it in other states, and usually it doesn't have as much to do with fire aisles as it has to do with seismic offsets and those types of things, but it's important to know what those are. What's good about this system is it gives you the freedom to choose uh, whatever fire aisle or offset you need. So for this example, um, we'll assume that spoken with the AHJ and they require a four foot offset so I can put that edge distance in there, it's four feet, and it's creating basically a boundary from the edge of this roof that is not letting me install modules within four feet of that roof edge, which is what we're looking for. Um, choosing the clamp color comes up a lot. If they're black, mo black frame modules, um, customers often wanna choose a black clamp. Uh, you can do that here, the module clamp. Oh, we'll go with a black clamp on this one. Just assume we're using black frame modules, typically what you see with the LG. Um, next uh, are thermal gaps. I'm going to get into this uh, in greater detail in just a moment. First, though, I want to go over how to remove modules and um, 
how to move, what's the, what can be some different options for moving this array around. So first question that might come up is how many modules do I, am I looking at right here? The easiest place to find that is down at the very bottom uh, of this window here. I'm looking at 52 modules here, so, or uh, about 18.2 kilowatt. Um, I'm just gonna assume for this example that that was what I was intending. But let's say that um, I needed to remove some, what would I do? Um, you can remove them from this window here by clicking this erase button and just clicking on the module um, here. We'll erase it. Um, you do have another option that might be easier to work with, and that's by switching to a 2D view. So if you look in the top right of the screen here, we have switched to 2D view option. So I'll go ahead and click on that. Now I'm looking at um, the roof sort of dead on here with the slope coming down. Um, if you click on first this button here with the four arrows, that's automatically going to fit this array, we'll call it area. It'll snap it to the exact array dimensions that we have. So I'll click on that. That snaps it in. This makes this easier to work with. Now let's say in this example, I had some limitations where this had to be a specific distance away and this had to be a specific distance away from the roof edge. How would I deal with that? Um, we have this button in the top right here. It's called show dimensions for edge distance. If I click on that and I zoom out, brings up some dimensions here. So we have 32 feet and 18.1 feet on there right now. Let's say for this example, this had to be 15 feet away. Simply click there, change this to 15 feet, click away, I'll snap it to 15 feet. And let's say this had to be 30 feet. Or I wanted it to be 30 feet. 30 feet there, snaps it in there. And there we go have it exactly the distance that I wanted it to be from these two roof edges. Now let's say that we needed to erase some modules here. Um, decided that, you know, maybe we, instead of 18 kilowatts, we were looking for 15. What are some ways to do that? So again, clicking on this erase tool or delete modules tool up here, I can hand click to delete them. I'll bring this down so I can see exactly what my, how it's changing my kilowatt here. Um, another option is if I hold the shift button and then click, I can delete an entire row. Or if I hold the control button and click, I can delete an entire column. So you do have options for that. Um, thermal breaks. So this one is tricky and I want to explain exactly why they're used and that might help make more sense when you see this. So uh, what, what is a thermal break? Thermal break is basically this line right here and it's a gap where we're not placing a mid clamp. It's where we're going to be placing some mini rail components. So why is a thermal break needed? Um, what we're doing when we're installing mini rails, we're installing some aluminum components on top of a steel roof. And because there's those materials are different, they have different properties when it comes to them expanding and contracting as they're you know basically baked under the sun. Um, you are gonna see some movement in those materials. We limit the thermal break to 40 feet or the array size to 40 feet to help mitigate some of those issues that you might see. Um, and again, this is not, I don't wanna say this is specific to mini rail. You will see this with any uh, PV racking system out there um, that is composed of you know, steel or aluminum. They are going to expand and contract over a long enough distance. Um, that's just the nature of using these materials for these systems. So what we've done in Everest is, um, place these thermal breaks in between these arrays to mitigate issues that you might see with uh, thermal expansion and contraction. 
So what does that mean exactly as far as the assembly of these systems go? So I will refer to our assembly guide to show an image of what this is referring to, which is shown in one of the steps below. Go to right here. So let me zoom in on this, make a little, makes a little more sense. So as we can see here, we have, this is where that thermal break is between these two modules here. Essentially what's going on is we're placing a mini rail component here, attaching an end clamp to it, as you can see in this photo here. Another mini rail uh, component above that with an end clamp there. So it's separating both of these arrays. So they're no longer having an effect on each other uh, with as far, as far as the modules expanding and contracting as they are heated up from the sun throughout the day. So that's what I'm talking about with thermal break. So with this system, we give you the option on where you wanna place that thermal break. From an aesthetic standpoint, for me, I always like to place the thermal break as close to the center of the array as I can. I like the way it looks. Um, that may not be best for a design standpoint, um, it's not to say in a bad way, it's just each, each system is different and where you want to place your thermal brakes is really up to you. Um, as long as that 40 foot requirement is met, you could really put this thermal brake anywhere. So I know that this array is 40 feet. I like to have it in the center because I like the way it looks. There's nothing wrong with doing it that way. It's just, that's the way I make, like, that's the way I like it, uh, as from a look standpoint, but can go anywhere. So how to change that. Um, let me get out of the erase tool here. Um, you can do this in the map view or the 2D view. It's up to you. I like to work on this in the 2D view. Uh, it just keeps things nice and vertical for me, parallel. Click on edit breaks. Um, this is how the first button is how we edit breaks. Um, you know, the ones going, we'll call this the east-west direction. You know, it may not be as far as the actual compass goes in this project, but we'll call it the east-west direction, we'll call this the north-south, uh, going up and down, make it easier. Um, this button here will edit those breaks that are you know, going the north-south. So um, we have a break right here. Not a fan of that one, I wanna move it right here, just to make it in the middle, kind of split these arrays up. Um, so in order to do that, I'll click on the area that I want, or I'll click on the line that I want to be broken, and then I'll click on this button here, break present. So that's gonna place a thermal break right there. I could leave it like this and have two thermal breaks, but that would be more expensive. Um, that would, that's just adding additional material that we don't want to do. So I'm going to place that break there. I'm going to come over here and then delete that break here. Um, a good rule of thumb for these uh, thermal breaks is the less thermal breaks you have, the less expensive the job is going to be. The less material you're going to use is maybe a better better way to describe that. Because for each thermal break we have, we're basically adding an additional mini rail component. Where there would only be one, there is now going to be two. So because of the length of this array, I have to have a thermal break. I have the option on where I wanna pick it, putting it in the middle, because I like the way it looks. We'll move on from there. So now we have that. So we have our system on this roof. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch back to the map view here so we can see that. There it is. Um, like the way it looks. Let's assume for this example, I'm happy with the module count and the output. And um, I know I'm meeting our requirement for fire aisles. Um, so the next question that comes down to is uh, the loads. How are we loading this thing? Um, this gets tricky. Uh, I get questions about this one a lot, and the best answer is on, on how to define, say, wind exposure risk category is really speaking with the engineer of record on the system. So I know that in some jurisdictions in the U.S., um, in jurisdictions in Mexico as well, the engineer of record is the contractor. They're the one who has the final say on, well, besides the jurisdiction, we'll say without the jurisdiction, the contractor is one who's making the decision on what the wind exposure category is. Um, 
there are some jurisdictions out there that don't require permitting for these installations. So it's important to understand exactly what wind exposure category is, what risk category is, how to find the wind speed, et cetera. So with wind exposure category, the best way to learn about that is to look at the ASCE 710 design codes. It has, there's a chapter that describes what these are, but I can give some rule of thumbs. Uh, Again, though, this is, um, and it says in the code, is subjective to the engineer's um, decision. They're going to use their best, engineer's best practice on what they consider to be the exposure category um, for the project. So from my experience, and I'll just speak on my experience, speaking with other engineering firms on what this project would be considered as far as exposure category goes, um, might be good to give some examples. So typically with exposure category B, as in boy, that's fairly typical of a residential area, um, like what you might see on the right side of this screen with these apartments over here and buildings over here. It's typically what you would see in a suburban neighborhood, completely surrounded by other homes for maybe a quarter mile in all directions. Um, might be surrounded by taller trees, heavily wooded areas, things like that are typically considered exposure B. Exposure C is, might be typical of this building here, where on one side it has a large open field. It's going to have some prevailing wind that comes through here unobstructed uh, onto the building. Exposure D would be typical of hurricane areas or buildings that are up against the coast which you could even see, you, might, you, could be, you could make that argument absolutely for California coast that it's exposure D. Um, with this, based off my experience, I think that this looks like an exposure C, as in cat, with having this open field here, prevailing winds that come through here. But again, the engineer of record will have the final say on what that is. But for this example, I'm gonna go with exposure C. So go ahead and click exposure C here, open terrain. Uh, again, one thing to know, limitations on mini rail. Uh, these systems cannot be installed in exposure D, as in dog, um, on those those uh, coastal installations. So it does not have that ability. So if this project was, or this roof was indeed considered to be exposure D, as in dog, then I would not be able to install mini rail on it. So it's important to know those limitations. Risk category, this is dependent on the building. Um, again, Looking at the AAC 710 codes would be the best way to figure out what these are, but I can give some general rules of thumb. Risk category one is considered a low hazard building. This would be like a, a farm, barn maybe, um, or a, a building that does not have, uh, you know, it's like a warehouse that's rarely used, doesn't have anyone working in it, that sort of thing. Risk category two would be typical of a house or a business. Uh, risk category three would be a school that does not have a shelter, as it no storm shelters. Risk category four could be a school with a storm shelter or a hospital or a government building, basically a building defined as high risk to human life. So with this one, I'm going to assume it's a business here, so I'll go with risk category two. Wind speed, how to find that. Um, the easiest thing to do is to click on this button here which takes you to a website where you can pull the wind speed. Again, this one is specific to the jurisdiction and the engineer of record may have um, some comments on exactly what the wind speed needs to be. But if you're trying to get a general idea, this website is a, a good option. You can paste the address in here, click on find, and then click get wind speed. And it will bring up the, the wind speed for that area per ASCE 710, risk category two, we're looking at 110 miles an hour. So I'll go ahead and enter that here. Uh, ground snow load, uh, again, um, you would find that by doing the same thing um, on this website here. Uh, for this one, I know it's zero snow load, Southern California, but um, you could look it up with the address there. Moving on to the results tab, um, it's calculating right now, bill of material. So uh, here it is, our system on the roof. 
um, what do these lines represent? So this blue line here is representing the mini rail component. The black line is representing the um, the screws where the screws are going to be installed on where the crest of the trapezoidal metal roof is. So that's what that looks like. So um, one thing I wanted to talk about is the roof zones. So to pull those up, you click on this layers button up here, and then we'll click on roof zones here. So that's what these colored areas are here. So mini rail, the limitation with our pre-engineered system is it can only be installed in roof zone one. So that is this gray area here. Roof zone two is the yellow areas, and roof zone three is the red for the corners. So that's not to say that mini rail couldn't potentially be installed in those roof zones, but you would have to have an engineer verify that uh, it could be, um, which some installers do if uh, the project calls for it. If I click on system details here, it'll pull up that basic information we're looking at before, module count and uh, the output. This would be the place to add um, wire management clips. This button here, we do offer some wire management options for the system. Um, so that's where you would click on this button and then add, add them manually, however many you would like. Uh, in the summary tab, um, we're able to see the bill of material for the system. We're able to generate a bill of material here, which will be in an Excel form, as well as generate our report. So I will go over this report very briefly uh, in a moment, but first I wanna show you how to add obstructions and do a roof fill. And let's say we wanted to add a second roof to this project. So um, let's say we were satisfied with this roof and we wanted to add some more modules to this roof here. We'll go through the same steps as before by clicking on add roof. This is a gable roof, rectangle, trapezoidal. So, We'll go through this a little quicker since we've already seen this before. Add the roof here. There it is. So now I have my roof. Uh, let's say we wanted to add some obstructions here. So again, we'll, we fill out all this information. We'll just, for the sake of time, I'll leave that there. Obstructions, how to add them. You have three options for adding obstructions. Um, I'll start off with the basic as a line tool. Uh, let's just assume that this right here is an obstruction that I did not want to build on. Could draw a line right there. I'll click to add the add a length. If I wanted to go in a different direction, I could do that. Let's assume that I'm happy with that length. I'll click on it when it turns green. That ends that that uh, function there. And let's say I wanted to create an offset there of uh, two feet. I don't want to be anywhere near that. Let's assume it's a piece of pipe or something. Um, now I have my offset in place. I can see that there's two obstructions here that look like vents. Um, Maybe the easiest thing to do is just draw a little square around those. Grab my square tool and wait till it turns green. There it is. If I wanted to copy that to draw it again, I can click on this copy button here. Um, but for the sake of example, I'll show you the last obstruction tool, which is a polygon tool. So let's just say for this example, it wasn't a nice square shape. Um, I could draw like a triangle around it or something. So we notice that this polygon tool snaps to certain degrees. If I don't want it to snap, I hold the shift button and then I can do a custom angle. So I'll just have fun with this and make it a kind of a weird shape. Uh, if you needed to draw something like that, you do have the option. So there it is. Um, Okay, so let's say now I wanted to, in this particular case, I wanted to maximize how many modules were on the roof. In that case, come to the design tab. Let me choose that LG module, the same that we used before, which was the A5Q1C. Come into module arrays, I'll click the plus button. I'm going to express, and now I'll click complete roof this time and click on add. So now it is doing a max fill into this roof. There it is there. So I know, again, it's defaulting to one and a half feet. We're not gonna want that for a couple reasons. One, it doesn't allow for our fire aisle offsets, which need to have those. And then two, it's putting those array or those modules a little closer into those zones that I don't want them to be. 
So in this case, as we said before, we knew we didn't, on the last roof, we didn't want to be within 12 feet of the edge when we moved that array. We could just put in 12 feet here. It will create a, a 12 foot barrier around and fill the modules in there. As you notice, it's not putting the modules on top of those obstructions that we have, those offsets. It's filling in everything around it. So that's a quick way to see how many modules you can fit on a given roof with a mini rail system. Change that clamp to black since the last ones were black. And then at this time, um, you can edit your thermal brakes as needed. Um, say we're happy with that, it's right in the middle. So not really much to change on that one. So we got lucky there. So that's how you add a second roof. If I want to go back and make some changes to that first roof, I would click this button up top here, roof one. Now I can go back and edit that roof. Roof two would be here. Um, so now I'm on roof two loads. I need to add the loads or make sure that they remain the same. In this case, they, they did. There may be a case where exposure category may change on a roof. I haven't seen that come up, but maybe it does. You would have the option to change that here. Come into the results tab here. It's going to calculate right now. There it goes. So we have those added in there. You know we're good on our roof zones, system details, same as before. Now we can come into summary. We have both of our roofs. Our total bill of material is here. Now we'll click on the report. So click generate. It's going to download a PDF. Here it is. Open that up. Here's a project report. Zoom in here to make it easier to read. Have our project information here. More project information here. Things we went over. This is specifically to roof one. It's more information. Some of that information we were talking about before. Distances to roof edges. Things like that. So that all comes in the report. At the very end of the report, here is the same thing for, uh, or sorry, that's, that's the last part of roof one. Here's the specific bill of material for roof one. And then the same information for roof two. So I'll scroll quickly through that. Um, we have our total bill of material at the end of this report as well. Um, so some things that uh, I've realized we could talk about some more before we get into questions here is um, some notes and naming the roof. So you do have the option to name the roof if you'd like. You could click on this button here, rename roof. So let's say for this example, um, you know, we were installing some modules here and let's say that for this example, this was also a trapezoidal metal roof and we added some modules over here. You would have the option to name um, those different roofs, maybe with different addresses. So I could come in here, click rename, and maybe this one is just called, uh, you know, roof A. I don't know what it is. We'll go with roof A. Uh, now I can have that as roof A, roof two. You could call it whatever you'd like. Uh, in the remarks section, this is where you could add some notes. So maybe, you know, um, assumed roof height, if I need to verify or something like that, um, you could add some notes in that section there. So do have that option. Um, so I think that pretty much covers um, the mini rail system. Uh, as I stated before at the beginning of this presentation, there's not a lot of component counts with this. So there's not a lot of um, those tricky situations that come up with um, some other systems with regard to component count. So um, pretty simple in that regard, which makes this a pretty simple tool to use as well. Um, so with that said, I am now going to open the uh, floor up to questions. So if you have any questions, again, please type them into the questions box and I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, 
uh, I have my first question here. Is it possible to export the layout into a CAD file? Um, unfortunately, at this time, it is not a possibility. That is something that we are working on in the background. I can tell you that um, it is um, definitely difficult to program, but it is absolutely something we're working on. It's something that we're trying to have for the future as for an ETA on when that will be completed, I'm not sure at this time, but that is definitely high on our priority list. So that, it, that will be something we're working on uh, for the future. But at this time, that is not currently an option. Are there any other questions anyone had? Keep this going for another minute or so. If you have any questions, now will be the time. Uh, is there, okay, so I have another question here. Um, is there some option to add pathways? So the easiest way, I'm assuming by pathway, um, you're talking about a path through the middle of the array, like a, a walking pathway. Um, if that's not the case, please please add another question in there to verify that. But I'll assume that's what you're talking about. I would say there's two options for that. Um, one is we could make this thermal break larger. So let me zoom in here. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit of lag from the webinar. Uh, come down to thermal breaks here. So let's say that um, I wanted to add a, a walk path right where this white line is, say here. Um, I could edit that thermal break um, and call instead of calling that default width four inches, let's say I wanted it to be four feet wide, so that'd be 48 inches. So I click on 48 inches there, and it will add that break and make it 48 inches um, wide. So keep in mind that that might delete some of the modules, which it did here. If that's the case, you can click on the array and open it up some more, and that will bring some more modules back. So you'll have to play around with that a little bit to find out what works best. But you could add you could add it that way. Um, another option you could do is using an obstruction. So let's say I didn't want to add it that way. Got four inches. Um, and let's say I wanted to add it, uh, you know, somewhere right there. Um, you could come in with that line tool again, and let's say it's a four foot wide. Put that green, click, and then obstruction offset will go with four feet. Um, so I think that's doing four feet on each side of this line. So two feet would be the correct one. There we go, now we have a four foot uh, pathway in there. So that's another option on how to add that. Um, let's see, perfect. Okay, Are there any other questions, guys? Um, we have about five minutes left, it looks like, so keep this running for another minute or so people some time to ask their questions if they'd like. Again, for those who may have joined late, um, this webinar will be recorded and we will send that to you guys either later today or tomorrow will be made available for you to um, look back over.
All right, well, looks like there are no more questions, so we'll go ahead and um, end the webinar in just a moment. Uh, first, I wanted to say thank you for all of those that attended today. I hope that this was helpful. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Let me bring up a note. So I can provide my email. Um, if you have any engineering related questions, um, we will say for the US or for Mexico, I can help out with that as well. Um, feel free to email me. My name's Tyler Wiggins. My email is t.wiggins at everest-solarsystems.com. Um, for those in Mexico who may have questions about wind speeds, so we'll just say Mexico technical support, um, you have a few options on people to speak with. Um, Miguel uh, Ortiz is a great person to speak with. He is our project services engineer. Um, and his email is m.ortiz at everest-solarsystems.mx, not .com. Um, and then another person to speak with uh, is Ernesto. And he, I will need to pull up his email, make sure I spell it correctly. <laughs> Actually, I would just say to speak with uh, Miguel at first. He can he can direct you to Ernesto if needed. So those will be the two people, two best people to contact. Um, look here, it doesn't look like I have any more questions. So uh, again, thank you so much for joining this webinar today. I hope it was helpful. Uh, any further questions, please feel free to email us. Email us. And uh, with that said, I will sign off.